Hey there kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and before we get started on tonight's story, I'm just going to give you a quick warning that I never really do on any of my stories, but it felt appropriate here. This story deals a lot with prison life, and as prison life goes, there's quite a few things I don't normally touch on, like very gross situations and sexual violence. So, listener discretion advised. And now, on to tonight's story. Big Rob grunted, Billy Tremont, and then hauled hard on the joint, decimating into a smoldering ember between his thick fingers. Yeah, him. Billy Tremont. He was a hack who worked the night shift. And I tell you something, he was just as dirty as they come. Fucking guy wasn't just on the take, he was the take. Know what I'm saying? He was as much a gangster as any of the boys in here. He controlled what came into the pen and when, and who got it and how much they got. The dude squeezed out whatever competition he had from the other cops, the ones who were playing the game, by any means available. He set him up to get fired, paid to have him shit kicked by the bikers, you name it. He was a complete fucking asshole, but he was also real good at getting you what you wanted, for a price. Well, it's a fact that people love a mystery. Especially people who ain't got a fuck all to do with their time. A few people pulled together some cash, and they came to Billy. Because if anyone could find the answers to their questions, Billy Tremone could. Billy laughed, tell him that he'd love to take their money, but he couldn't do what they were asking. He says that the weird little bastard didn't have no file far as I can tell. Don't know who he was, why he came here, or where he came from. No one does, and that's the goddamn truth. The guys called him a bullshitter, and Billy got serious on them. He narrowed his eyes, said to him, you guys don't think I tried to find out for myself already? <laughs> far as I can tell, the kid just sort of popped up into the fish tank out of thin air. It looks to me like everyone just kept processing him along because no one wanted to admit that they didn't know who the fuck the kid was. Call me a liar again, I'll beat the fear of God into you. It was clear that they weren't going to get anywhere with Billy, so the guys, What kid? Wait a minute, man. Which one's the kid? Richie's eyes looked like black bottomless pools. <laughs> Remember that. It always sunk deep into the mindless tar pit of addiction by then. He was past a point of no return. You could see it in his eyes. Shut up, dummy. Rob turned to Mikey and made a gesture that said, please continue. Mikey gave Rich a cold stare and said, so the guys give up and said, fuck it then. And that's that for a while. Life goes on. Then comes a day when Billy saddles up to one of the cons while he's sitting in the morning chow line and tells him he's found some information on the fish, if anyone still cared to know. Billy was looking bad, they say. Looked tired. Looked scared. That night, Billy comes to see the guy in his cell after lights out. He asks the guys for a smoke. Billy had quit smoking years ago. Billy says to him, I don't want any money for this. Keep your lousy fucking money. I don't want to be the one that can't sleep at night is all. You pieces of shit got him into my head. I couldn't get him out. Fuck you for doing that. Fuck you people sideways. The guy said Billy Tremont's hands were shaking. So fucking bad he couldn't, he couldn't hardly get his smoke lit. No, Billy tells a con. The curiosity had been eating him fucking alive. So he spent some time thinking on how to go about getting what he wanted. And then, picked his mark. Billy always had his ear to the ground, you know the type. He knew this and that. He did what and where and why. He knew stuff about people. He knew that one of the suits in the office had a bad coke habit. Kind of raging habit that most people can't afford for long. He also knew that the suit and the warden were both banging the same chick, warden's secretary. Now, Billy gave him a quarter ounce of good rock cocaine, told him what he wanted. Promised to shoot the guy an eight ball on top of what he'd already given him, if the guy could deliver the goods. Well, 
So he came back to him a few days later with the sniffles and a file folder that looked older than the Bible. <laughs> it was made out of some rough, crumpled old cardboard, dry as dust. The office stiff says the warden's secretary told him where to find it, locked up in a cabinet in the warden's office. Said he'd put himself in all kinds of dangers to get it. And he wanted more than a ball for his troubles. He wanted more than a quarter, too. Billy told him that he could either take the ball or Billy could let the warden know that one of his minions wasn't just a cokehead and a thief, but he was dipping his wick into the warden's honeypot, too. The Billy told the suit that the ass fucking the warden would give him wouldn't be anywhere near as bad as the one the wolves would deliver. The guy shut his yap, took his eight ball, parted ways. So in between drags of his smoke, Billy tells the con that the first documents in the folder were pages taken from a court transcript. Some backwater courthouse sitting way out in cow country. They were handwritten with an old time pen. Billy says, you know, the kind you had to dip in a fucking inkwell, then pat dry against the blotter so the shit didn't smear. That's how old this thing was. All the dates, the kids' names, they're all scribbled out, Billy said. But he figured that the first documents in the folder were from the late 1800s. Nick snorted. <laughs> that ain't fucking possible. Mikey shrugged. Is what it is, Nicky. Transcript said the kid had been charged with multiple murder, practicing satanic rituals, cannibalism, arson, mayhem. He was only 16 years old when they tried him prosecutor wanted to hang him for his crimes, but the defense lawyer that the Crown had appointed was some greasy little fucker. He argued that it would be godly to let the kid live out the rest of his days in jail, seeing as how the kid was known to be an orphaned vagrant who raised himself in the woods. No more guidance in the woods. That was the argument. The jury ended up getting all pious. And they commuted the kid's date with the rope to a life sentence. They shipped him off to the clink, and that very night, killed his cellmate. And killed him with his nails and teeth, and then he ate the poor son of a bitch. Coltrane looked disturbed. Holy fuck. A horror movie. Sorry, but you guys have got to be shitting us. Mikey shrugged again. I don't wish I was, but no, I'm not. Not according to Billy Tremont, anyway. Billy said they stuck the kid in a loony bin for the criminally insane after he ate his celly, put him in a straitjacket. At some point, quacks realized that the usual treatment wasn't going to work for shit, so they decided to give the kid a lobotomy. He was out like a light from the ether. They were just getting ready to start. The kid suddenly breaks his arm restraints and sinks his teeth into the lead surgeon's throat like a goddamn wolf, ripped it right out. There's no way that he should have still been conscious, let alone being able to snap those thick bands of leather. But he was. And he did. The way I heard it, Hutch said, after he killed the quack, they put the kid back on the stand. This time, he got 12 votes for death. Took him to the town square, marched the kid up to the gallows, with the townspeople screaming, throwing moldy bread and cow shit at him. He was laughing at him. Hangman put the rope around his neck, asked the kid if he had any last repentant words to share with the crowd. The kid says loud and clear, There's nothing to repent in doing what you want. I'd fuck your mother and fry up her heart if I wanted to. And after I was done picking my teeth, I wouldn't so much as fart her a blessing. Why should I? So the cops beat on the kid with the clubs a bit, put the hood on the little fucker, and the hangman pulls the lever. But the trap door won't open. Don't know what to do. All the while, kids laughing and cursing at him, praising the devil, being a you know, general pain in the ass. People were screaming for him to swing. It was getting ugly out there and fast so someone gets the bright idea they could just put the kid up against a wall and shoot him and just be done with it. Only that didn't work either, Mikey added. His words becoming thick and slurred. Sounded like the hooch was starting to do his trick. They put the kid up against the brick wall, 
Five cops took aim. Five cops pulled the trigger. Five guns misfire. They try again. Same shit happened again. By now, the people watching were getting spooked. A crowd of farmers and mill workers who came out to watch the kid hang. They all suddenly had places to go. People left. The Lord's Prayer was on more than a few set of lips as they went. When everyone was gone, the cops packed the kid back in the wagon because you know, there was nothing else they could do. Took him back to the courthouse, and after some debating behind closed doors, the judge had him sent to a different jail. He was locked up in an unused room in the basement. Then, they boarded the door. And then, you know, for good measure, they bricked the whole thing over. Richie attempted to focus his eyes up at Mikey and ask, Can they, can, can they really do that, man? We just put someone in a hole, brick the fucker over? Nick spoke up. His voice was hoarse. Maybe not these days, but he's talking about, like, back when a lot of people didn't have a birth certificate, so they could have done that. I mean, who would ever know? He lit another joint and passed it. So what, man? They just let the crazy little fucker there to die? Richie appeared to be in the grip of a dubious species moral outrage another good question Richie maybe you haven't killed every single brain cell yet after all Nikki slugged back some more of the noxious hooch and grimaced Billy Tremont said that there was only two other documents in the folder an extremely fucking old mugshot and a report to the board of corrections from a sanitation engineer it was written sometime in the 50s He'd been down in the old basement of that very same prison where they walled up the kid. He was down there checking out the shit pipes. Didn't have fuck all to do with what he was looking for, but the engineer mentioned in his report he'd found a bricked over doorway down there. Curiosity got the better of him. He tore away the crumbling old bricks with a crowbar, pried the boards off, popped the door open. And you know what he found? A skeleton, Mitchie muttered. He was struggling to keep his eyes from sliding shut. No, nothing. That's what he found. When he forced the door open, the room was empty. We all took a few moments to digest this. And then Bulldog gave his gun. Don't forget about that. Hutch rumbled. He handed the J back over to Nicky. Nick curled his lips in disgust. Who slobbered on this shit? He demanded. It's wet as fuck. It's gross, man. Fucking gross. No one owned up to the deed. Nick started to bitch about it some more, and Hutch gave him that look. The one that said, shut up immediately or regret it. Nick shut up. Mikey snickered. Thank you kindly, Hutch. And Nicky? Come on, kiddo. Just pinch off the wet part. Stop your bitching. Anyhow, that fucking prick bulldog. Right. He was one of the least loved hacks in the entire history of this joint. A real, genuine, dyed-in-the-wool piece of shit. He was still a few years south of retiring when this all happened. Late 50s, I'd say. A huge, fat, red-faced motherfucker. Meaner and fuck. His blood pressure was right off the scale, all the time. There wasn't nothing he liked better than to find an excuse to smash some unfortunate bastard upside the head. He'd do it with a sock full of quarters that he kept hanging on his belt. When you heard the jingling of the chains, you straightened up, you stopped fucking around till it was gone. That nasty old fuck was in a mood. Uh, you steered cleared and you kept your big gap shut. So they put this fucking guy on watch in front of the kid's cell. Doing the graveyard shit, right? He was all alone too, no partner or nothing. Guess the other hacks didn't like the fat mouthy fuck either way. But there he was, night after night, just him, this creepy little kid, all night long. Normally, this wouldn't have been very good for the con being watched, being alone with a tired, grumpy bulldog, no witnesses. It would have been a long, long season in hell for most cons. But the fish wasn't the usual white boy dummy we get in here, you know. Like a kid who got mixed up with something stupid, wasn't rich enough to buy his way out of it. Not this fish. It was something else entirely. Mikey paused and forced down a big gulp of Pruno. Hutch jumped in. 
Well, old Bulldog only lasted for about a month before he got his shift supervisor and requested he be taken off the watch. The head screws office door was open at that. Some dude named uh, Tags or Rags or some shit I can't remember. Anyway, he supposedly overheard most of the conversation while he was waiting to see the warden. Well, why was why was he waiting to see the warden? Richie mumbled. As for usual, Richie wasn't really getting the main focus of the story. Fucking ratting on someone, right? Fucking goof. Eat those fuckers. Rat needs to get hurt, bro. Fucking rat needs to get... Jesus, Richie, go on the nod or something, wouldn't you? You waste of skin. Hutch looked dangerously displeased. Richie grinned a big, goofy grin and whispered, Fucking rats, though. Hutch frowned at him thunderously, then continued. So, tags or rags or whatever, here's Bulldog say that he wants off the watch. The boss asks him why. He won't say, just that he's tired, doesn't like watching the kid. Boss asks if he wants a partner. Bulldog says no. Just wants off the goddamn watch and that's it. So, head screw huffs, puffs, blows him off. Gives Bulldog some shitty speech of not, not wanting to abruptly change everyone's schedule for one fucking guy. And how he did do that. Little Johnny wouldn't see his daddy up in the fucking stands at his next ball game. And it would fuck him up for life. You know, guilt in the fat prick. And that sort of thing, you know. Then he tells Bulldog no, sends him on his way. Bulldog went home, drank most of a bottle of whiskey. Then, stuck his service pistol in his mouth and pulled the trigger. Nicky roached the allegedly slobbered on joint and blew out a tremendous lungful of smoke. There was no way the smell of the dank wasn't rolling through the whole goddamn pod by then, but none of us were concerned about it. If everyone was behaving themselves, the COs would leave us to our vices in peace. The situation was volatile enough already. Mikey piped up and said, That sad fucking thing, you know? When one of us string ourselves up or a guy gets his hands on a razor blade, no one gives a fuck. Hacks laugh at you because our bowels that go and you fucking shit yourself when you die. That's your obituary, right? Life goes on, no one gives a second thought. But this asshole sticks a gun in his yapper, blows his brains out the top of his head, and hell, suddenly he's a hero. There's even a big article in the local paper about how the stress of being on a correction officer causes depression and blah, 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 blah. Sensitive souls can't handle the gritty reality of working with drugged out ass fuck convicts. It's kind of laughable, really. You know, whoever wrote that article didn't know Bulldog personally, that's for sure. Hutch interjected. But the fucking newspaper didn't mention nothing about what actually drove the piggy to blow his head off. Fuck no. No mention of the kid at all. Kid was the warden's nasty little secret because they didn't know who the fuck the kid was or where he came from. And one way or another, the creepy little bastard was making people dead. All they had to go on was an old court document that read like a horror book. Passed mention of a sanitation report. Black and white picture of someone who looked like the kid couldn't possibly be the kid i was suddenly aware i was getting a bit freaked out in the soft red gloom stoned out of my tree every word that mikey and hutch uttered seemed frighteningly plausible i cleared my throat and announced i, I gotta tell you guys this is a fucked up story I'm getting creeped out down here hutch blinked down at me with inebriated surprise shit i forgot you even down there quiet little fucker ain't he more bubbly in your cup, my friend. Still hadn't managed to finish my first helping of the vile stuff. I shook my head and finished Nikki's doobie instead. Mikey lapsed into silence. We were silent with him. In the silence, something dawned on me. I said, Hey, Mikey. When they brought the kid to a different jail and walled him up, after they couldn't execute him, that was this place, wasn't it? When you guys first saw him, he wasn't a new fish at all. The kid was the oldest con in the entire joint. That one's pretty smart, Mikey, Hutch said. Compared to Richie, he's a fucking scholar. Should make him our treasurer or something, what do you think? We ain't got nothing to treasure here, old man. Not this fucking shithole. Mikey poured himself another shot of the eye-watering concoction in the bag. 
But yeah, you got her, buddy. According to Billy Tremon, it was right underneath this very building. He let out a raspy sigh and hoisted aloft his Dixie cup of hooch. To Billy Tremon, he said. I sincerely hope God took it easy on you. How'd he die? Nikki asked. And Mike flashed that humorless smile again. Not long after Bulldog ate some lead, he woke up to the sound of a gunshot in the middle of the night again. They found Billy Tremont dead on the CO's locker room. His brains and bits of his skull were sliding down the wall beside his body like snails. The coroner declared that it was another suicide, but here's the thing. They found five chunks of lead embedded in the wall, all at chest height, and one in his brain. There was a full cup of coffee spilled on the floor beside him, but he still had a vacation request for him clutched in his free hand. Mikey leaned back against the wall and let out a scornful gust of air. So according to the official report, here's Billy sipping on a fresh cup of coffee about to go to the office, request some vacation time, and suddenly, right there and then, with no warning or reason, decides to shoot himself. Before he does that, he fires all the bullets in his service pistol into the wall, except for the one he fires through his own temple. Now, that's an odd way to go, don't you think? Nick looked disturbed. The kid came for him. That's what happened, isn't it? He appeared very young and very vulnerable in the dim crimson light, his face unlined and guiltless. It got out of its cell and he was coming for him. The cop tried to shoot it, then turned the gun on himself before it could, you know, get him. Can't say for sure, Nicky. The only guy who can is 13 years in his grave. Remy tentatively cleared his throat from his top bunk. He said something to Hutch about the power going out before. Something that happened when it did. What were you talking about? Nah, maybe we shouldn't get into that tonight. Hell, might as well tell him the rest. Hutch rumbled. Gone this far, haven't we? A week after Billy bit the dust, a storm rolled in, knocked the power out. Clear across all county. We all heard it into our cells, told to shut up, fucking behave. A lot of the hacks couldn't make it into work that night on account of roads being fucked up with accidents, torrential rain, all that shit. So the bosses who did make it to work were all carrying heavy firepower. Made it clear they weren't going to fuck around if somebody got out of hand. Now, right around midnight, I hear a shotgun go off somewhere on the other side of the pen. Can't mistake that sound, you know, if you're familiar to it. I was wide awake on my feet in a heartbeat. Sort of muffled, far away, I hear screaming. There was a boss standing nearby in my cell, and over his radio, a voice was squawking. He's out! He's out of his cell! He killed Amesley! He's ripping everyone apart! Get your asses over to solitary now! Hack took off running. I turn over to Johnny Franzini. He stole the words right out of my mouth. He says, the boy, he's loose. This is bad. It was dark in there, but I'm pretty sure I saw Johnny cross himself. Mikey's eyes glittered at us in the semi-darkness, glassy from the drink and wide from the memory on his lips. There was a second gunshot. And then a whole lot more. They echoed and they boomed and they scared us shitless. When they tapered off and we heard more screaming, it sounded like, like animals at a slaughterhouse, you know, squealing, buck wild, and they breathed their last. Now, me and my silly, we fucking hid in the corner with a mattress in front of us. We didn't know what was happening. Just the hacks they tried to shoot something and they didn't fucking succeed. I'm not afraid to admit it. I, I mean, I, <laughs> I was shitting my pants. I heard feet come slapping across the cement, then three hacks sprinting past our cell, Hutch said. They weren't just running, they were fucking sprinting, hauling ass like Olympians. I seen their faces for a second. They were wild with fear. I've never seen anyone look like that, before or since. Everyone was hollering at him as they passed, asking him what the fuck was going on. They didn't answer, they didn't even hear us. They just ran on by, kept going. 
After a few minutes, a fourth guy comes along. He's limping real bad. He's using his rifle as a crutch. He got left behind, I guess. Hack looks looking over his shoulder and a lot of sort of jog hopping as fast as he can manage. He's leaving a trail of blood behind him. Hack's uniform was shredded and torn on one side of his body, flapping around like rags. And I, I yell at him, hey, what the fuck happened to you guys? What's going on? And he stopped in front of the cell, right? See the guy a little better now. I wished I hadn't. It was, it was Amesley. He wasn't dead. At least, not yet. His right arm had been shredded to almost nothing. I mean, it was just a few flapping pieces of meat. Stringy shit, oozing blood, barely holding the bones together, right? His right thigh was missing huge chunks of meat, too. And most of the foot. Guy's face was gray from blood loss. His eyes were like dolls, like two pieces of round, murky glass, right? He, he was in shock, moved his mouth trying to find some words and said, I think I'm dying. Then he started hopping again. There was puddles of blood on the floor where he stopped. Okay, that's enough, Remy said. And his voice quivered a little. I, I, I don't want to hear anymore. I don't remember asking if you did, Mikey asked. Remy pursed his painted lips and went silent. Hutch continued. I heard something else coming then. Something like something running on all fours, something with claws. I backed up against the wall as far as I could go and Johnny cowered down to his bunk, his blanket pulled up around his face. He came in fast and ripped past my cell like a fucking blur of arms and legs. Now ten seconds later I heard Ainsley start start wailing like a like a siren, you know, it was awful. No death screams, man. Nothing else could force a living creature to let out such an awful fucking sound. It took me a moment to understand that Ainsley wasn't just screaming. He was saying something. He was saying, Mommy, it's eating me! Mommy, it's eating me! And then I remember I, I, I was screaming right along with him. So was Johnny. The whole pod was screaming, you know. You remember that, Mikey? All of us, 200 murderers, stick-up men, fucking screaming in unison like little girls. I will never forget that. Not ever, Mikey said, quietly. Hack finally stopped making noise. We all did. I mean, you could almost taste the terror in the air, right? sharp and bitter. I could smell Amesley's blood. Coppery smell that gets in your throat makes you want to retch. So quiet. Silent as a tomb. I could heard a pin drop, then slowly. So slowly. I, a figure comes strolling into view on the range. A kid. Man. Red from head to toe, completely covered in blood. Guts. Shreds of stuff that keep sliding off of him, dripping onto the floor. He wandered right down in the middle of the range, and he was carrying Ainsley's head by the hair, you know, dangling beside his leg as he walked. I watched him as he passed by. I, I, di I didn't breathe. Not once did I even fucking dare to breathe. The kid, the kid ambles up to the hack shack, you know, just a, as casual as can be. He puts Ainsley's severed head. On the ledge of the window. And he walks out in the middle of the range. Raised his arms. Pointed at all of us. I mean, each individual cell. Like he was marking us. Each and every one. Marking us for death. When he was done, the kid walked back the way he came. Disappeared from view. That was... That was the last anyone ever saw of him. He was just... gone. There was a minute of silence. Finally, I spoke up. Why the fuck did I never hear about any of this before? I mean, how? It should have been everywhere. The news, TV, crime shows, fucking everywhere. Nick chimed in and said, I never heard nothing about this either. I used to love those fucking crime shows. No, you never heard anything about that. But you might have heard something about a prison riot, Mikey said. 
According to the newspapers, the cons took advantage of the power outage and went apeshit for a few hours. Most of the guards on duty died trying to stop us, the story goes. The government funded a swell new electronic locking system, all because of what happened that night. I thought about that for a moment and then said, I, I, I don't know. What don't you know, huh? I fucking tell you the rest, how's that? Hutch glared down at me and his narrowed eyes slammed phantom punches into my face. They froze. The three hacks that we'd seen running for their lives, they ran right into the arms of the SWAT team, who'd just gotten on the scene with their guns drawn. The cops busted through the gate, they found what was left of Amesley first, ignored our hollowing, and followed the blood trail. They found the rest of them in the hallway. The one that runs down the middle of solitary, lying in a raw heap with blood congealing in a pool beneath the bodies like the gravy. All the cell doors had been ripped away from their hinges. The cons inside had been torn into pieces. From what I heard, it took a crime scene cleanup crew six days to clean out that wing. And even after that, the cons and the hacks... They were finding dried up bits of flesh and bone for months on end. We told you what happened. And you can believe it or not. I don't give a fuck. And neither does Mikey. And ask around if you want to. There's some long timers here that might have been able to talk about it. If you give them something to loosen their lips. And once again, I don't give a fuck. His whole pod had nightmares for a long, long time. I'm probably going to have them till the day I die. I doubt I'm the only one. There's something within these fucking walls. It looks human, but isn't. It's something you don't want to meet, and believe me. You better hope you never do. Hutch stopped talking then. And as the hour was late, and we were all pretty fucked, the silence soon turned to sleep. I recall dreaming of a fair-haired young man who stood amongst us as we slept. Silent as a shadow, his eyes completely black in the feeble glow of the emergency lights. His expression vulpine, hungry. I remember that in the dream I was very, very afraid that the boy would sense that I was not actually asleep. If he discovered I was awake, he'd devour me. I remember this quite clearly. We awoke early in the morning to the pitiful sounds of a junk-sick Richie heaving into the toilet. The lights were back on, the lockdown was over. Richie wasn't the only one who was feeling like shit that morning. We were all in pretty rough shape, especially us floor folk. Sleeping in a sitting position on cold concrete makes for a stiff, painful morning. None of us had much to say. We all sat and smoked, waited for the hacks to do morning headcount. I wondered if pounding hangovers weren't the only reason for that. I suspected I wasn't the only one whose sleep had been disturbed by the fair-haired specter. thing that should have ceased to walk the earth years before, but just hadn't. thing with a terrible appetite. The cops finally came around and let us out of our cages. They pointedly did not perform the morning cell check. If they had, they simply wouldn't have had enough cells in solitary to confine all the rule breakers. We all were trooped off to stand in the chow line except Richie, who opted to stay behind and undoubtedly indulge in a snort or two. And that... That's pretty much where the story ends. Well... Almost. I was released a year early for good behavior. During the rest of my time there, most of Mikey's crew was paroled, either through the front door or the back. Richie was the first one to get wheeled out the back way. Then eight months later, Coltrane's skull was pounded into a new and messy format, and he followed Richie out the back door. Six months later, before I was uncaged, Big Rob Hutch had a heart attack. He was walking upstairs that led to the tier above ours. He fell backwards, clutching his chest. He was dead before he somersaulted over the last few steps and landed at the bottom. So for a while, it was just me, Mikey, Nick, and a few casual homeboys. Got 
exploring. The crew unraveled the seams, and by the time I was paroled, it had ceased to exist. A few months after my divorce was finalized, I got nostalgic one night, and I decided to try and find Mikey online. Soon enough, I did, though it was through his obituary. He died in the hospital of a short illness, not long after I was released. Remy was also deceased, victim of a shower room stabbing. Nikki? Nikki had discovered he was in a mental institution. Yeah, I visited him there once. I'd rather be in jail any day. Most of the patients I saw there were zombies, you know, chemically bitch slapped into subservance by their meds. There are a few others who were just strange. Gaze made me feel unsafe, for Christ's sake. I did time in a federal penitentiary, you know? I was shown to where Nicky sat by himself at a table, and he instantly recognized me. We greeted each other like old friends. Made small talk, just like anyone would. He seemed completely normal to me. I didn't understand why he was in there until I... Until, until I mentioned Hutch. So what do you think happened to Hutch exactly? I asked him. And his relaxed grin suddenly became a twisted grimace of fear. He seized me by the front of my jacket and hauled me close. His eyes burned bright with fiery red intensity. He hissed. The kid pushed him down the stairs. It wasn't a fucking heart attack. That's the cover-up. The kid got Mikey to it. it. It ate everything but his head. It, it left his head on his fucking pillow. The orderlies grabbed Nicky and pried him off of me, and they dragged him away while he screamed and flailed and twisted in their iron grip. I watched this with an open mouth, and my heart pounding. And then I went home, and I got very, very drunk. Somewhere within those prison walls, there's a... a thing thing that hungers and sometimes it feeds I don't expect you to believe this any more than I did but do you know what on nights like this with the wind howling and the fine hairs standing up on my neck I couldn't care less what you believe and if you were ever unfortunate enough to meet him face to face. I bet that kid wouldn't care what you believe either. Hey there kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and thank you so much for watching tonight's video. And if you guys are not listening on the podcast, then I strongly suggest you check out Spotify. The Mr. Creepypasta Storytime podcast on Spotify is exactly what you see here on YouTube. Or if you're listening on the podcast, I strongly suggest you check out YouTube. The Mr. Creepypasta channel on YouTube is the exact same thing you see on Spotify. So uh, really, there's no reason to cross platform unless you just want to see more things or you want to see more of me, which you can also do on Twitter at Mr. Creepypasta. And as always, I want to give a big thank you to everybody who supports me on Patreon. That includes everybody who's been waiting for me to update my Patreon. And I thank you all so, so much for being so patient with me. But especially, I want to give a thank you to Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Jacob Fenske, Stephanie Butler, Bobby Carmen, Chance Burnett, Diana Krause, Tristan Pelton, Acid System, Adam Garrick, Aaron Stormcrow, Ika Limchok, Amber Clark, Angelus, Atomorous, Bastion Beefcake, Blue the Enigma, Braden Morris, Broken Beast 320, Captain Scurvy, Caspian, Shelly J, Cordy Tension, Cronut 509, Crusader Chocobo, Cryptic Nightmares, Curse Pox Primark, Dakota Lane Whetstone, Daniel Paulson, Darth Miver, Deleted Account, Dirt Diver 030, M, Esteban, Bester's Lampshade, Freddy Krueger, Gorag Tri Magazine, Grand Moth the Milky, Hades Nephew, Happy Birthday Jason Wilson, Harley, Himbo Jerry, Horseman Set Time, Insanity Gamer X, Jake Cairns, Jesus Cornell, Jordan Humble, Justin LaFontaine, Kaylee Ambrose, Kiri the Slot, Crazy Kid, Cryolinian, 
Lambda M98, Lisa Cottrell, Little Crow, Lord Life's Best, Lupita Galvin, Love You Eminem, Matt Bach, Melted Lake, Michael Allen Jr. Bashirs, Mike, Mr. Marcus Blitz, Nate Cull, Nico Kyle, Psychomel, Red Shadow Cat, Rob Like Sharp Things, Sam Ahai, Sashi Sasaku, Seclude, Spricket, Tali Sue, Tater Chip, That Creepy Chick, The Ginger Bros, Turtle Man, Voice of Sand, William King, Xavier and Cheyenne, Yargul, and Zachary Graphius. If you'd like to join this list of names that I horribly mispronounce, then please head over to patreon.com slash mrcreepypasta, or you can always check out the names in the description down below, and I appreciate it infinitely. So thank you all on Patreon. Thank you all so, so much. And to everyone, sweet dreams.